Welcome to the world of Compututor. I'm Brent Seltzer. Hey, I congratulate you on the purchase of your new Commodore 128 microcomputer. This is an investment into the future that's going to pay for itself just as quickly as you learn to operate it. See, there are really only two tough elements to deal with when learning to use a microcomputer. The first is getting it from the store to your home or office. However, you have now passed that first hurdle, and from here on it does get easier. If you're concerned that you're going to have to spend hours and hours learning computer technology theory just to use your machine, relax. See, the object of this Compututor program is to teach you the basics of operating your machine, not the basics of building it. Now, because trial and error is still the most effective method of education, this Compututor program has been designed for you to view as often as you choose. You can review any segment or operation again and again until you're comfortable with the procedure. That's why we recommend you first watch this program one time all the way through without trying to use your machine. That way you'll see what kind of information you'll be covering and what you'll need in the way of backup materials. Then, set up your computer, even if only temporarily, in the same room with your video cassette machine and television so that you can watch and participate on your machine at the same time. You know, in many ways, your computer is much like a library building. Because like a library building, your computer can be filled with large amounts of information. And instead of waiting hours and days, and sometimes weeks for that information, it takes only minutes. Well, that's just what your computer is all about, the high-speed storage and retrieval of information. You might find it interesting to note that your microcomputer represents the sum total of over 150 years of research and development. No, that's true over 150 years. See, back in 1834, a British mathematician named Charles Babbage invented a mechanical device that would eventually give birth to the first design of the first analytical computer. The machine he built was designed to add, subtract, multiply, and divide. However, this sort of Rube Goldberg contraption had a little trouble with the multiplying and dividing. That's because it was made of all moving parts that had to be precision made. So the first model tended to shake so hard during the multiplication and division process that it actually fell off the table. All right, as computers grew in stature, they actually shrunk in size. And today, the same kind of computer that took up two floors of a building is no larger than or even as powerful as the computer you're about to use. You know, a wise man once said that a thing is known by what it does. And what your computer will do for you is to store and retrieve large amounts of data in short periods of time. And the list of applications is virtually as long as your imagination is wide. I'd like you to keep that in mind as you begin to discover how to use your Commodore 128 microcomputer. Soon we'll be assembling your C128, but first, I want to talk to you a bit about computer terminology. Now, you remember a little earlier when I mentioned to you that getting your machine from the store to your home or office was among the more difficult aspects of using your computer? Well, here comes the second one, computer terminology. You see, the inventors, designers, engineers, and builders of computers seem to have created a language of letters, numbers, and sounds that are as Greek to most of us as, say, Greek, come to think of it. For example, when you hear the computer term basic, you probably think of the word basic. Well, any good dictionary would define the word basic as meaning fundamental or essential. However, the computer term basic is an acronym, or it's a word formed from the letters of a series of words. So basic, in computer terms, stands for Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. And this is just one of the languages that is used to create the programs you run on your computer. You see, the engineers who designed and built these micro-wonders developed a kind of shorthand. They abbreviated sentences into words, and words into letters. But I think after a while, you'll be able to figure out a lot of these words for yourself. In fact, to show you how logically some of these terms came into existence, let's go over a few of the more common computer terms. For example, later, you'll learn to boot up your machine. Now, don't panic. All that means is starting with a computer that is powerless and turning the power on, preparing it to follow your commands. It's one of my favorite things about computers. You get to command them. Booting up is a term taken from the old mountaineer's expression for when climbers reached the end of the rope, they would use the straps off of their climbing boots to make a loop on the rope, 
catch their foot in it and start climbing up the rope again. So when a computer program was written to start up the system of a computer, it took the name of the bootstrap program. When you boot up your computer, you're starting up the rope of computing. Now, a little earlier, I promised you no long technical lectures, and I'm going to keep that promise. So without putting you through a long series of diagrams, I thought you should know approximately how the computer works. Actually, it seems to work like your own brain. It has a central processing unit called the CPU, which coordinates all of the information and sends it where it should go. The information in a computer is stored in its memory, and that's like your memory. The computer has two kinds of memory. The first is called read-only memory, or ROM. Read-only memory is built into the machine, usually at the factory, and it's usually permanent, forever. It tells the machine how to be a machine. You have ROM too. When you were born, you didn't have any real conscious memory or experience, but you knew how to breathe, make your heart pump, your eyes work, fingers and toes move, and of course, keep the diaper service busy. Well, that was your survival memory. Well, in a sense, that's what ROM is all about. Next comes random access memory, or RAM. That's the part of the machine's memory that is accessible to all the information or experiences you put into it. It's like all the experiences you remember since birth, or at least slightly thereafter. In the computer, RAM is the same thing. It's memory of what information you put in the machine on a day-to-day -day basis. Well, that's a pretty good translation from computerese. However, you don't need to use computerese to use a computer any more than you need to know how to strip a carburetor, flush a cooling system, or change the points and plugs of a car just to drive one. I mean, you learned how to boot up your hi-fi, and you figured out how to store or record movies or TV shows on the RAM of your videotape machine. So learning a few of these computer terms won't be that difficult. The best way to use this computer program is to stop the machine and rewind to any point and play it as many times as you want, allowing you to learn at your own pace. I'll be right here for you, well, until you put me back in the box. Now, in the next segment, you'll be setting up your machine, so I'd like you to take a minute right now and think about where to put it. You should place the machine somewhere that's convenient and comfortable, a place where you have plenty of light and electrical outlets. And I mean the grounded kind with the three prongs for the three hold plugs that come with the equipment. Also, pick a place that makes it easy for you to look directly at the monitor screen and put it at a height that's good for your hands. After all, you don't want to get wrung out wrists after a short shot at the keyboard, right? Oh, by the way, very important, extreme heat or cold is not fun for your computer. Temperatures above 90 degrees can cause your machine to crash. Not, not on the floor, that's just a slang term for any time your machine stops operating properly. And that could cost you all the time and effort that you've put into working on a particular program. The result is that you could lose whatever current material is in the machine's random access memory at that time. Temperatures below 60 degrees in your computer may be too cold to start, kind of like a car on a winter day. And even if it does start, it could be kind of sluggish. So, try to avoid putting your computer near hot air ducts, radiators, direct sunlight, and, of course, moving glaciers. Uh, something else to consider. Whether you own your own home or rent, better call your insurance agent and make sure that your insurance policy covers your computer. Because in most cases, your current insurance won't cover it. Oh, last thing before we move on. Don't forget to fill out all of those warranty cards and send them to the manufacturer. At the beginning of our program, I congratulated you for getting your computer. Now I congratulate you for sitting through this little orientation. Coming up, we'll be assembling the equipment and getting ready to use your machine. So, you might want to stop the tape here and review this segment if you like. Find a place to put the machine. Maybe even take a quick break before moving on. Take your time. It's up to you. You don't have to worry about me. I told my mom I'd be home late.
Welcome back to Compututor. In this segment, you'll be taking a tour of your machine and then assembling the equipment in preparation to use it. There are a few things you should have standing by. Some diskettes, usually a box of 10 is a good start. Oh, and don't forget paper and ribbons for your printer. And if the salesman at the store didn't sell you these things, give them another chance. Now, it would be very handy if you would keep all those owner's manuals that came with your equipment nearby, because I'll be referring you to them from time to time. Okay? Let's get down to business. Now, you may have already removed your computer from its packing cart and have it completely assembled. Or maybe the salesman at the store assembled it for you. Even so, it might be a good idea to stay with this part of the program. It'll give you a chance to make sure that you have all the information down pat. Hey, look at all this stuff. You know you could read any one of billions and billions of different technical books all about the internal workings of a computer. However, there is a much simpler way to approach this information. All right, now here come some of those computer terms. Hardware and software, what are they? What's the difference? Well, hardware refers to the machine and its peripherals. A peripheral is anything that plugs into the computer, like the disk drive, or the printer, or the screen. They're all pretty hard, hence the name hardware. Software is the reference to the programs you run on your computer, which come on these diskettes called floppy diskettes. We call them floppy diskettes because, well, they're kind of floppy. I'll be talking more about these later on in our program. I think the easiest way to relate to the difference between the two, uh, hardware and software, is your videotape machine. The cassette machine itself with the tuner timer, that's the hardware. The actual video cassettes you put in the machine, that's like the floppy diskette that holds the software. And the movies or TV shows you record on the cassette, well, that's like the program instructions we call software. Right now, let's put our attention on the hardware. Now, because you won't be able to pass through the television screen and sit here at this machine to get the hands-on experience. I want you to meet my assistant, Das Nitz. Well, here on the video, he'll play your part. Of course, you'll appear live in your own home version. But by watching our friend, you'll be able to see what he's doing, which is what you should be doing. Usually. The biggest thing you'll notice is the television screen or the monitor. You can call it either one. And then, of course, there's the favorite technical term, the CRT. That stands for cathode ray tube. In fact, that happens to be the name of every television picture tube. But don't go looking for the late show on your microcomputer. In a way, the CRT is really like the mouth of the computer. When the machine wants to communicate with you, it does all of its talking right here on the screen. Sometimes, it may even beep at you. This is the keyboard sometimes called the keypad. It looks just like a typewriter keyboard because it is just like a typewriter keyboard. You'll notice that most of the keys look just like a typewriter keyboard. And there are others that don't. In a little while, we'll tour that keyboard and show you what all those keys are for. You will speak to your computer through the keyboard. That's how it hears you giving it commands. Don't, don't bother talking to it now. You have to press the keys to get your message across. This is the disk drive. A disk drive is like a little record player that records as well, so you can store information and bring it out again and again. It's in these little disk drives that the floppy disks do their business. In fact, you could think of these little disk drives as filing rooms and the floppy disks as file cabinets and the material you store on the floppy diskettes as the actual files. Now, let's get all this equipment assembled. In fact, you might want to dig out the appropriate patch cords as we take a little tour of the right side and back panel of the machine. Those, those aren't the cords. We put those cords away. So. See, the gang at Commodore made it real easy for you to assemble your 128 personal computer by labeling all the locations where the patch cords go. So all we have to do is plug in the cords. Here on the right side is a series of input locations. Well, that is to say, locations where you're going to put in some cords that connect the various peripherals. Right here is where the power cord will be plugged in, which we'll do last. Next to the power cord input is the off-on switch. I think the name says it. The smaller switch to the side of the off-on control is a reset switch. You'll use that to reset the computer without having to turn the entire system off and on again. These two inputs, or ports, are called the controller ports. 
Now, you could plug in joysticks, like the kind some of you used on your Commodore 64, or you could plug in a mouse. Well, that is to say, a mouse cursor control device. Now, you're probably familiar with these, but if you're not, the mouse will replace your need to move the cursor with the keyboard. You could move it a lot faster with a mouse. Now, we'll get back here in a few minutes to plug in the power cord. But speaking of plugging in cords, let's move to the back panel of the machine. This big rectangular opening is the expansion port. See, sometimes you might be using software that comes in a cartridge format instead of a disc or cassette. The software cartridge would simply plug in, and then you would turn on or boot up the machine, and the cartridge program would automatically be loaded. The smaller rectangular opening is the cassette port, and if you're using a cassette machine for storing your data, you would plug the cassette patch cord into this port. And that brings us to the serial socket. That's this round hole next to the cassette port. From this port, we will hook up our disk drive and our printer. Take one of the two serial patch cords, or what is sometimes called DIN connectors, and plug the end into the serial port. Notice the little notch on the plug? Make sure you line it up with the little groove in the receptacle. Now, look at the back of the disk drive. Notice that there are two round ports. Plug the other end of the serial patch cord into either disk drive receptacle. Well done. Now take that other patch cord and plug one end into the remaining receptacle on the disk drive and the other end into the connection on the printer. This is located on the back side of the printer, usually in the lower right hand corner. Now we come to the monitor. There are several options for using a color television as a monitor. This is for low resolution display, or what is called a composite monitor. And what that means to you is that the screen will only show 40 characters per line. Another system is called an RGB hookup. Now that means hooking up the computer to a color monitor that shows a higher resolution display, or 80 characters per line. In case you've always wondered what RGB stands for, it means red, green, blue. The primary colors used to make all the other colors. They could have just called it a color monitor, but they didn't. If for the sake of example you wanted to set up your own color television set as a monitor, here's what you'd do. First, you set this little switch called the channel selector switch. You can see the letter L, which stands for channel 3 on your television on one side, and the letter H, which stands for TV channel 4 on the other. You must set this switch to one of these two channels. The one to choose? Well, that one is whichever one is not being used by one of your local television stations. That way, whenever you want to use the color display of your television set, you'll know what channel you'll have to tune in so as to see the program. Uh, the computer program, that is. Now, after this switch is set, you just have to plug a regular RCA patch cable from the socket marked here as RF socket. The other end of this cord would plug into a computer TV switch box. More than likely, you'll be hooking up your 128 computer to a Commodore 1902 color monitor. Easy to do. There are two patch cords. This way you'll be able to use your new 128 software in 80 column or 40 column display. We're going to use both cords. First, take the RGB patch cord, uh, sometimes referred to as the shielded cable. Now attach the pronged end of the small D-shaped connector into the back of the 128 here at the location noted as RGB1 monitor. Oh, make sure you line up the D-shaped part of the connector with its receptacle. Now plug the other end in here on the back of the monitor in the port marked RGB input. Hey, you're doing great. In fact, you've passed the halfway point. Now take the other patch cord that came with your monitor and line up the DIN end of the plug with the other round port on the back of your 128. This is called the video socket. At the other end of this cord, it splits into three cords that are white, yellow, and red. Now, don't worry. This won't be confusing. On the back of your 1902 monitor, next to the RGB input, are three standard RCA inputs labeled from top to bottom, audio, video, and chroma. The white output jack is plugged into the top hole marked audio. The yellow output cord is plugged in directly under that into video. And the final red cord is plugged into the jack marked chroma. Later on, when you reboot your equipment, you'll learn how to adjust the monitor.
On the far left side of the back of your monitor is the location for the power cord. Plug in the receiver end to the monitor and the other end into any three-hold wall socket. With your disk drive, you also received a power cord that plugs into the back of the drive and then into the wall. Finally, take the power supply system that came with your Commodore 128 personal computer and plug the square DIN connector into the power cord outlet we showed you earlier. I want you to plug it in the same way you see my friend plugging it in. That's it. Oh, very good. Very good. Yeah, it's a good machine, too. Now, you'll notice one last rectangular port on the far right side of the back of the machine. That's the place you would plug in your telephone modem. Now, that's a device that allows your computer to call other computers. I mean, you could send letters direct from your computer. You could do your banking. You could have access to various major database services, local bulletin boards, or even your office. All from your Commodore 128 computer. Well, you've done a great job putting your machine together. You should rerun this segment of Compututor one more time, just to make sure. Or, you might want to read over pages 5 through 13 of your Commodore 128 introductory guide regarding assembly. Otherwise, why not take a break before we boot up and learn the general machine operation? If you like, head out to the kitchen for a bite to eat. I wouldn't mind that myself before we go into the next segment of Compututor. Hey, how about if we send out, you know, we go out for a pizza or send out for a pizza? How about, like, mushrooms? We get some mushrooms and some cheese and some extra garlic and, of course, win some anchovies, right? On the phone. I was on the phone for 30 seconds, and in 30... Welcome back to Compututor and using your machine. Well, in our last segment, you really put it all together equipment-wise. Now it's time to boot up and go to work, because now you're ready to turn on your machine. First, turn on the monitor switch to allow the CRT to warm up. And then, reach around the back right side of the computer and switch on the on-off switch. There's the screen with the Commodore logo at the top with the words Commodore BASIC V7.0. That means you've booted up directly into the BASIC or Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. Now below the four copyright lines on the top is the ready prompt. And below that is the flashing block called the cursor. By the way, you can adjust the brightness of the monitor by adjusting the controls behind the little door at the base of the monitor. If these things didn't happen, then turn off your machine, wait 30 seconds, and repeat the sequence again. Now notice up on the screen this flashing block. It's called the cursor, and that's a pointer. And it's used to point to what comes next, or where the next character will appear. All right, you're ready to start learning your keyboard. As we mentioned earlier, it looks like a typewriter keyboard that has a bunch of extra keys. Now, just type in your name to get the feel of the keyboard. Type it in as though you're using a regular typewriter. Kind of fun, isn't it? Now here's an exercise. Press a letter key, any key, and hold it down. F is a good key. See how the machine keeps printing out that letter? Well, the longer you hold any character, letter, or number key down, the longer it continues to print on the screen. Now try using the right and left arrow keys and see what happens. The longer you hold down the keys, the more the cursor keeps moving. Using the left and right arrow keys allows you to move the cursor through the word. This is handy for making corrections. I'll explain the up and down arrow keys to you in just a moment. If you use the arrow keys to position the cursor somewhere in the middle of all those F's you just typed, you can erase the character to the right just by pressing down the space bar. I'd like to pass on a few words to you on the subject of mistakes and errors. Don't be afraid or embarrassed to make them. Your computer won't breathe a word to a soul. See, getting used to using a computer requires you to make a certain amount of errors. See, the machine is very specific about things like which letters, numbers, or symbols you should use. For example, on a typewriter, you could use a small L for the number one, and it would look the same. But to a computer, a small L is only a small L, and the number one is only the number one. 
When you make mistakes, the computer will tell you with an error message. It will show you the error message with either a series of numbers or words, noting specifically what the error is all about. Now, they're referred to as the error codes. In your Commodore owner's manual, you'll find a list of those error codes. What we'll do here is give you a rundown of what all the keys do. Then, we'll add some software in the next segment and let you see some examples. First, I'm going to show you where things are on the keyboard, so that when we put a diskette with a program in the machine and boot up, you'll know where to put your fingers when the instructions are given. Press down on each key as we talk about it. However, until the program is in the machine, don't expect the kind of result I'll be talking about right now. See how the letters and numbers of a traditional typewriter keyboard are right in place? The little graphic symbols on the front of the letters or character keys are exactly that. Graphic symbols, sprite graphic symbols. Those of you who have experience on the Commodore C64 computer will see all the familiar keys you worked with before, and a few more. Down along the left side of the standard section of the keyboard are three of the command keys. Now, the command keys are used to send specific messages to the computer. These keys can be used by themselves or in combinations with other keys. This first one is called the control key. It's got a lot of jobs. Primarily, you'll press it in combination with other keys to signal the computer that a certain control function is to be performed. Now, if you look directly below the control key, you'll see the run stop key. This key has two jobs, depending on the software you're using. The run stop key is used to run a function or program and stop a function or program. Computer ease is so tough to figure out, huh? Okay. Next to the run stop key is the shift lock key. Now, if you've ever been around a typewriter, you know that the shift lock key will lock the shift key down so you can type in all capital letters. If you don't know your way around a typewriter, well, at least you know what the shift lock key is for. Below the shift lock key is a control key found only on a Commodore. Therefore, it's called the Commodore key. Now, this key does a bunch of neat little jobs for you. First of all, by pressing the Commodore key in combination with the shift key, you'll go from typing upper and lower case letters to typing uppercase letters and the graphic display character set. Those are the symbols on the front of the character keys. By pressing down the Commodore key and any one of numbers one through eight on the number key row, you'll be able to use a second set of eight colors for the cursor. Finally, if you're planning to use any Commodore C64 software, just press this key while turning on your Commodore 128 and it'll go immediately into the C64 mode. Is that handy or what? Now, let's put our attention to the other side of the character keyboard and notice on the top row two keys called Clear Home and Insert Delete. Let's start with the CLR or Clear Home key. You see, Home is the computerese reference to the upper left corner of the screen, like Home Base. So if you were to press the Clear Home key by itself, well, the cursor would simply jump from wherever it happens to be to that home position in the upper left corner. On the other hand, if you press the shift key and the clear home key together, the screen will clear everything on it and move the cursor to the home position. It's like starting with a clean piece of paper. Now, the insert and delete key. I know that right now you're probably thinking, well, that key is for inserting a character or a word or anything, as well as deleting a character or a word. Well, you hit the nail right on the head. You see, using the shift key with the insert delete key, you create a new blank space to the right of the cursor. But when you don't use the shift key, you delete one character or more to the left. Now, just underneath of these two keys is the restore key. It's used along with the run stop key to take your computer back to its standard condition. You know, while I'm thinking of it, most of the pre-packaged programs you'll buy for your C128 computer will disable the restore key and the stop function of the run stop key. This is just to prevent you from losing valuable material you might be working with at that moment. Under the restore key is an even bigger key called the return key, as in an electric typewriter return key. When you press that key on a typewriter, you return to the beginning of the next line. Well, when you press the return key on a Commodore 128, you send whatever you typed into the machine's memory, and the cursor will move to the beginning of the next line. Now, there will be times when you're typing in some information, and you just might make a mistake. How will you know? Well, when you press the return key with misspelled or inaccurate information, 
you will get a message on the screen. These are called error messages. Appendix A, that's in the back of your Commodore 128 owner's manual, lists the error messages and tells you how to correct them. On the right side is another set of number keys. They're set up like a calculator keypad. Now, let's take a look at the keys across the top of the keyboard. Here you have four sets of four keys each. Let's take a look at the first set of keys. The first key is labeled ESC. That stands for escape. And that's the key you can use to virtually escape from whatever you're working on. It may not always stop a program, but it will suspend it from operating until you're ready to go. Or it will simply take you back to the last commander function you were working on. Next to the escape key is the tab key. Just like a typewriter, the tab key will move the cursor to a pre-selected spot automatically. To the right of the tab key is the ALT, or ALT key. ALT stands for alternative. And with certain programs, you can press the ALT key in combination with other keys and get a whole group of jobs handled all at once. So you could assign a special job to a key or a series of keys that will only happen when you press the ALT key either first or at the same time. Next to the ALT key is the caps lock key. And like the shift lock key, this key will keep you typing in all capital letters. This next set of four keys starts with the help key. And if you're like me, you're gonna use this key quite a bit. You see, in a lot of the software you'll use, there are help screens or explanations that will help you work your way through a program. So when you press the help key, you'll get help right up on the screen. Next to the help key is the line feed key. Okay, line feed is a term that goes with your printer. When you press the line feed key once, you'll cause your printer to advance the paper one line. Like when you press the carriage return of a typewriter one extra time to get one extra blank line. The more you hold the key down, the more blank lines you'll have on the paper. The next key over is marked the 40 slash 80 display key. Now that key is used to switch the display on your monitor back and forth from 80 column to 40 column mode. However, you can only use this key to set the display format before turning on or resetting the computer. The last key of this set of four is the no scroll key. That means that when material is rolling across the screen or scrolling and you want to stop the action, press the no scroll key. And like the brakes of a car, it'll stop the action until you press it again. The next four keys to the right are the cursor movement keys. These keys move the cursor around the screen in whatever direction the arrow is pointing. The last set of four keys are called the function keys. Now, although there are only four keys, you can have eight functions. Function keys are great. Now, if you're writing a program, you can program these keys to do big jobs with single keystrokes, sort of like automatic transmission. And a lot of prepackaged software that you'll use these keys are already assigned jobs to do in a single keystroke. That makes it faster and easier on you. And after all, isn't that what your Commodore 128 is all about? Now, let's talk about disk drives. They hold the software data and programs that you'll be moving in and out of your machine. Oh, in case you're not sure what programs are, they're like ooh, instructions that tell the machine what to do. Make sure you never open a disk drive and try to take a diskette out while the green light is flashing or on. Or while the diskette is moving inside, you'll damage the diskette and you won't do the drive a whole lot of good either. Before you boot up, I think you should know what a disk operating system is all about. It's like an office manager who takes responsibility for seeing to it that certain files are kept, stored, and used in a certain way. Now, the office manager gives the other clerical people in the office all the policies and directions on how to handle the work so it coordinates with your needs. Well, that's what your disk operating system does. Just as you direct your office manager to use certain uniform commands to the office staff that keeps control over how work is done, the DOS is a collection of programs that give special commands to the machine and your programs to ensure the material you want is where you want it and the way you want it. When you put the DOS in the machine and boot up, the cursor will come up under the ready prompt. That's the word ready. It's like a prompter in a high school play who tells you that you're on or what's next. In the next segment, I'll be telling you to boot up your machine with your disk operating system in the drive, and we'll get started with some hands-on usage. Hey, just for fun, let's take a look at a diskette. I'll just uh, open one up so you can see what's inside. These are very... Uh, 
well made, very secured. Uh, I just. Oh, yeah, no problem. Okay, take a look inside, and what you see is just a little record in a little record jacket. Only you leave the little record in the jacket. Now, don't you ever do what I just did because you won't be able to use the diskette again. In fact, you must make a point of not touching the diskette in any of these exposed locations. And when you're holding the diskette, be gentle. It'll be better for both you and the diskette if you hold it lightly on the outside edges. It won't be in danger of being damaged, and you won't be in danger of having to buy another one to replace it. I mean, I can just put this on my expense account, if I ever get one. Okay, now, as you can see, it's just a little record in a paper sleeve. I want you to notice how the sleeve has an oblong hole cut here. Well, when the diskette is in the drive and spinning around, the drive reads the material off the diskette from here and moves it into the system and the central processing unit. This is the place the system writes material onto the disk, too. Also notice this notch here on the paper sleeve. If you cover this notch with the little sticker tabs that come with the diskettes, it prevents the diskette from being erased accidentally, much the same way those little tabs in the back of your audio cassettes are taken out to prevent you from accidentally recording over it. And you can remove the tab if you ever decide to use that diskette for something else later. So if you already have something on the diskette that you don't want to lose, use the sticker to protect it. Also, label it accordingly. The labels come in the box with the diskettes. Oh, on the subject of labeling your diskettes, unless you're intending to first type or write the labels before you put them on the diskette, you should always use a felt tip pen to do your labeling. That way, you won't take a chance of damaging the diskette by pressing hard on the surface. Your label should consist of the name you want to call the diskette, the program you're working with, and the date you started the diskette. Now, in a little while, you'll be backing up or copying diskettes, and you'll have a chance to see it all working. Backing up or copying diskettes is very important. You see, a floppy disk has only a 40-hour life expectancy. Now, that just means that when you read and write a diskette, the process takes only a few seconds. And when you divide that into the diskette's life expectancy, 40 hours could last you a very long time. But floppies can be fragile, and anything can get misplaced or mishandled. So making backup copies is like having a carbon copy, or more accurately, duplicate originals. We suggest that you make three backups of every disk you have. Two of them are for general use, and one is to be called a fire copy. Now that fire copy is the one you might want to store in a fireproof location, like a safe deposit box, or some sort of fireproof box in a safe location away from the machine. Now. Before we end this segment, I've got some new terms for you. Bit and byte. A bit is an acronym for a binary digit, B-I-T. And eight of these little bits make a byte, B-Y-T-E. And a byte is equal to one character on the screen. So if you have a hundred bytes, you have a hundred characters. But with computers, even a blank space takes a byte. See, computers only have a certain number of bytes available, and you don't want to waste space. Almost all computers you'll see offer space in thousands of bytes, or kilobytes. That's the metric measurement of about 1,000 bytes. The number of bytes available in your random access memory, or main memory, RAM, tells you just how much material you can put into the machine's memory. If your machine has 128K, that means you have 128 kilobytes. And if you want to take that a step further, if you were to fill a page of text, you know, like a letter or a report, you'd be able to put about 2,000 bytes, or 2K, on a page. So that means a machine with 128K RAM could hold about 64 to 68 pages of text in the machine before you had to store it. Of course, some of that space might be used by the program that helped you type in the text. And that brings us to storage. Very important. See, the memory is like, um, it's like a blackboard that's only so big. And when you fill it up, you either have to store it away and bring out another blackboard, like a floppy disk, or you just erase it all and start again. You, you erase it all and you start again. Storing the blackboard is done by commanding the machine to save the material in the memory on a diskette, which you'll learn to do in just a little bit, a bit of time, that is. Now, in a few minutes, we'll be booting up that DOS that you've slipped into the drive and showing you the major commands. 
But I must say, you've been working real hard, and you should be congratulated. So, why not take a break, or review this last segment of Compututor, and relax before we begin using your machine in the next segment. Maybe you just want to get up and take a stretch, or take a look out the window in case it's raining outside. Of course, if it's raining inside, you can skip the window. Welcome back to Compututor and Using Your Machine. In the last segment, we toured the equipment and ran down the keys on the keyboard. In this segment, you'll be learning a series of procedures and commands, or instructions, that you give the machine. And this is where the DOS, or Disk Operating System, comes in real handy. Some of the most important procedures and commands are called directory, to let you see what's on the disk. Copying, for copying an entire disk and sometimes single programs or pieces of data formatting or putting the header on the diskettes to allow them to hold information. After a diskette has been formatted, it can become a data diskette. Save is the command used to save a program that's in the machine when you want to make sure that a particular piece of data or information has been saved. Now that way, it's a sure bet you'll be able to load that data back into the machine. And that brings us to load, the command that brings a program or file from a diskette into the machine. You'll also learn the run command and that causes a program that has been loaded into the machine to go into action. However, in an effort to make your Commodore 128 even easier to use, the gang at Commodore have created for you a special diskette called the DOS shell. And it comes right in the box with your disk drive. And what is really great about the DOS shell is the way it combines certain commands together in the logical order by which you would actually use them. And what makes it even easier is that this DOS shell is what is called menu-driven, just like most of the software you'll use on your C128. Now, let me quickly explain the term menu-driven. If you go into a restaurant and sit down at a table, the waiter will give you a menu. Oh, thank you. All right, it's a collection of all the different dishes, or in this case, all the options available to you. You pick out what you want from the menu, now, that usually saves you having to read all the ingredients or even cooking the meal yourself from the recipe. So rather than have to totally understand the nature and operation of every command, you can just order them off the menu as you need them. Now, I'll give you an example of using a DOS command without the DOS shell first. Then, we'll go right to the DOS shell. The first command you will learn is called directory. It's the command that lets you see what programs or files may already be on the disk, so you'll know what to ask for. First, let's boot up the machine, if it's not already on, and then put the DOS diskette in the drive. Now, the screen looks the same, so let's get ready for the first command, directory. This is easy to do. Simply type in the command word, directory, and press the return key. Now, if there are more entries than will fit on the screen, as in this case, the display will keep on moving straight up until it reaches the end. The list is complete after you see the cursor sitting next to the prompt. Now, if you want to see it again, just repeat the sequence by typing in directory. Don't be afraid. Just type in directory. And press the return key. Did you notice how the screen moved when you typed in the directory command and then the information filled the screen? Well, that's called scrolling. Now, the best explanation of scrolling I can think of is this. Back in ancient times, you know, before the invention of the paper cutter and the copying machine, the written word was put on scrolls. Oh, like this one, except, of course, they were much older. It's just a long piece of parchment or paper-like material, you know, sometimes with pieces of wood on the top or bottom. 
Now the scroll was rolled up and you would have to roll it in both directions to move up or down the scroll, right? Like that. Well, information sometimes scrolls up and down your CRT just like that. So the smart folks who invented computers figured since it seemed like having a scroll in your computer, they would call it scrolling. Well, that's why you have a no scroll key on your Commodore 128. When you want to stop the scrolling process, you press the key and it stops. To pick up where you left off, press the key once more. There's an easier way to see the directory. Press the function key marked F3. Not only the command directory will appear on the screen, but also it goes into action. However, to make it even easier, let's go ahead and reboot the machine with the DOS shell already in the drive. You would simply press the reset key and you've rebooted. But before you do, make sure that you have pressed the 4080 display key so that your display will have the same 80 column size characters our screen has. Whenever your machine is busy doing something, it usually gives you a message telling you what it's doing. At the moment, it's busy loading the DOS shell. When it's ready, it will tell you to press the F1 function key to go forward. Press the F1 key. Now the machine is asking what language you'd like to work in, and since we all speak English, quickly press the space bar, and there's your disk operating system menu on the screen. Now, we want to see the directory before we want to program, if for no other reason than to make sure it's there. So, using the down arrow cursor control key at the top of the keypad, let's move the cursor to the program marked Run a Program and press the space bar. And there's your directory. I think before we go forward, I should explain what you see on the screen. There appear to be six columns on the screen, but actually there are three columns. It's just duplicated one time because of all the programs filling the entire screen. So let's concentrate on the first column of three. The first column shows numbers. The second shows the names of files. And the third are initials indicating the type of file. This letter refers to the drive. We have one drive, drive A. If you add a drive, that would be called drive B. This is the name given to the disk when it was formatted or given the header command. You'll learn to format disks and you can name them anything you want up to 16 letters or characters. But make sure you always start a file with a letter, not a number. You could call a disk a data disk or a, a program disk or even Murray if you really wanted to. The rest of the numbers on this side of the file names are the block numbers. That tells you how many blocks to a file. A block has about 250 characters or bytes, so four blocks would roughly make 1K and 14 blocks would roughly make one page of printed text. This line shows the number of blocks you have left on the disk for more files. To the right of the file names are three letters. Those three letters describe the type of file. When you see PRG, that stands for program. That means any file that says PRG at the end is a computer program. SEQ stands for sequential files, and that refers to data files. From, say, a word processing program, or maybe even from a spreadsheet, even a database manager file would be marked SEQ. You may occasionally see USR, which stands for user, and that's like sequential or a data file. You may even see REL, which stands for relative. Now we're going to use a program that will automatically format or put a header on a diskette, allowing it to hold data, allowing us to copy files to it. You want to be able to do that. You see, the floppy diskettes could also be called flimsy diskettes. Although the life expectancy of the average disk is about 40 hours of real use, accidents do happen. So it pays to make at least one backup copy of all your program diskettes and data diskettes. As a matter of fact, we recommend that you make at least two backup copies and store one copy in a safe place away from the computer. Oh, like, say, in a safe deposit box at the bank or some fireproof container. Press the stop key to return to the main menu bar. 
Move the highlighting cursor on your main menu to the program that's called Formatted Disk and press the spacebar. The program instructs you when to insert a blank disk. Go ahead and do that now. Replace the DOS shell with a blank diskette that will soon be used to receive data when you press the spacebar. When you do, the program will ask you for a name. Let's call it Data Disk. At the end of the highlighted area, you can see a comma and two blank spaces. That's for your identification number. So you may have more than one disk called Data Disk, so you can add an ID number to tell them apart. Let's press the comma key and type in the numbers 0 and 1. Whenever you want to activate a DOS command, just press the return key and the machine tells you that it is formatting the disk in drive A. Now you have a formatted data disk. Replace that disk with your DOS diskette, but keep it nearby, you'll be using it. Now we'll show you how to back up your program diskettes and your data diskettes by learning how to copy files. Now looking down the list of programs on the disk operating system shell, we want to find a particular file. And there, in the middle of the second column, is a program called Copy Files. See, and you thought this was going to be tough. Well, because most of you use only one disk drive, this is the only way to back up programs. So I want you to move the cursor down to the program called Copy Files. Now, press the space bar. First, the program shows you the entire directory of the disk and instructs you to move the cursor to the program you want to copy and press the space bar to select that program or file. Right now, the arrow is pointing to a program called How to Use. Press the space bar and the program is highlighted. If you press either the down or right arrow key, the red arrow on the screen moves to the next title. So move that cursor one time to the second column and the program labeled How To Part 2 and press the space bar here too. When you're ready to copy the files, press the function key marked F7. When you do, the program asks if it's okay to copy the file list you've selected. See, the machine likes to help you along by making sure that you're sure of what you want to do. So using the right cursor key, move the cursor to the letter Y and press the space bar. Now the machine reminds you that whatever programs you had in the memory would be lost. But we don't have any other programs in the memory. So press the space bar to continue. The program tells you to insert the original disk, if you haven't already. But you already have, so press the space bar again. Notice the machine is telling you that it's reading from the original disk. Well, when that's finished, you'll be given an instruction to replace the current disk and put in a blank disk. Do so. Now the program is asking you if you want to format the disk first. This is just in case you forgot to format a disk first. Your Commodore 128 gives you one last chance to do so before you try to copy a file or file. However, our disk is formatted, so we can skip this procedure and press the space bar. Now the program is telling you that it is writing the files to the copy disk. When the copying is finished, the screen returns to the main menu. Let's make sure that our copy was an accurate copy. I want you to move the cursor to the program called Run a Program. That's the one we use to get a directory. And press the space bar. There you see the two files we copy. Now you could copy an entire disk this way, or you could use another program called Copy a Disk. This program works like Copy a File, but it will continue to copy until all the files on the first disk are on the second disk. However, when there are a lot of files being copied, you have to watch the screen for instructions when to change disks. The more material on the disks, the more often you might have to change the disks. 
but whenever you copy an entire disk, always check the directory to make sure you made a good copy. You've now learned that you can command your computer to show you a diskette's programs by typing in the word directory and pressing the return key. You can also press the F3 function key and get a directory. You can also use the run a program command from the DOS shell. Now you've learned how to format diskettes to hold data and how to copy files and an entire diskette. Now you're going to learn how to delete a file. First, place your data diskette in the drive if it isn't there already and press the stop key to get back to the main menu bar. Now move the cursor down to the delete command and press the space bar. Move the cursor to the second program, How To Part Two, and press the space bar. The program you want to delete is now highlighted. Now press the F7 function key to activate the command and the program asks you if it's okay to delete the current list. Move the cursor to the letter Y and press the space bar. Now move the cursor to the run a program command so we can read the directory and press the space bar. And you can see that the file deleted is just that, deleted. Oh, one last thought before we move on. When the machine directs you to give a command or add any information to a command, make sure you spell it and type it exactly as it appears. See, when you misspell a command or phrase, the machine doesn't recognize it. So it's as though no real command has ever been given. Now, a little later on in segment six, you will actually write a short program in BASIC. That's Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. And that's where you'll learn to save, load, and run a BASIC program. Now, let's get on with learning the disk operating system commands that will be so important when you begin using pre-written software. Let's see how you can use some of the automatic functions of the DOS shell. Let's load a program from the DOS. Press the stop key to return to the main menu bar. Move the cursor to run a program. Press the space bar. And you'll see the directory showing one entry, Commodore's How to Use program. Press the space bar, and the program name is highlighted. That's always your cue to activate the DOS by pressing the F7 function key. Right now, we're not going to run this program, so we want to stop. Commodore made that easy to do on your 128 by giving you a stop key. Press that stop key now. The screen says break in 24, and below that, the word ready. Break in 24 means that the program stopped on its 24th line of instruction. We'll talk more about program lines in segment six. Below the word ready, the cursor is flashing. We want to go back to the DOS shell main menu. We do that simply by pressing the F1 function key as we did at the beginning of the segment. Now there are four other commands on the DOS shell and I'm going to explain them to you, but you don't have to try them out until later. The first of these commands is called Disk Printer Setup. And that's the command you would use if you have more than one disk drive. That way you can assign numbers to the drives. You also can assign a number to your printer. And that printer number will usually be four. You'll care about that quite a bit when we want to print material out, which we'll be showing you in the next segment. Now, looking at the bottom of the third column of the screen, the last three DOS commands, Restore Files, rename files, and reorder the directory. Let's begin with restoring files. Now, you know, sometimes you can accidentally delete a file that you didn't mean to. Well, don't panic. That's what the restore file command will do. If you haven't already filled up the available space with other material, your old file will still be there. And the restore a file command allows you to ask for that restored file by name. Renaming a file is just what the command name would imply. Maybe you have a file called tax data and you want to change it to something else like say, Murray. It's possible. Just choose the rename a file command and replace the old name with the new one. Now to keep your disk files really neat, you have a reorder the directory command. That's the command you'll use when you want to change the order of the directory. Maybe you prefer alphabetized listings or grouping your renamed files in a different order. 
you'll find a lot of help starting on page 33 of the disk drive manual that came with your Commodore 1571 disk drive. Oh, another very important option of the Commodore 128 is that you can run CPM programs. CPM stands for Computer Program Manager, and it's one of the oldest and most popular disk operating systems for business application programs, like anything from PFS or even WordStar. It has counterpart commands to the ones you've used, and the nice folks at Commodore even included a copy of the CPM disk operating system, along with a whole section of their book on how to use CPM. Although there are some differences in the nature of what the screen looks like and the command name, for example, in the C128 mode, if you wanted to look at the directory, you'd either use the DOS shell or you would type in directory. With CPM, you would type in DIR, short for directory. When you want to format, you would type in the word format. If you wanted to erase a file, instead of using the delete command, you would use the erase command. To copy a file or files, you would use a command called PIP, or Peripheral Interchange Program. So you see that you have three computers in one, but all three computers work in a very similar fashion. So whether it's a favorite old Commodore 64 program, or a CPM program, or a new Commodore 128 program, your Commodore 128 gives you the best of three operating systems whenever you want it. Well, you've worked your way through the disk operating system. However, you should run this segment again. Also, feel free to consult the owner's manual regarding the keyboard. Now I have a treat for you. The fine folks at Commodore have supplied you with several diskettes. I mean, you received the DOS shell with your disk drive, but your system came with two disks, the CPM disk and the Commodore tutorial disk. Before you move on to the next segment, you might want to take some break time and use the tutorial disk. It's an excellent opportunity to practice what you've learned, as well as getting a lot of hands-on experience. As a matter of fact, it's really a lot of fun. Then, whenever you're ready, go on with the next segment of Compututor. It's your choice. It's okay with me, because, frankly, it really beats waiting around in the box, you know? Not funny one bit. First of all, it's hot in this box. Secondly, it takes the line out of my sweater. And thirdly, that's not the way you... Welcome back to Compututor and using your machine. Well, so far, we've learned to assemble your Commodore 128 and boot up with the DOS, or disk operating system. And having been through the important commands and procedures, such as directory, or seeing what files are on the disk, copying a complete disk, saving files, loading a program, and running a program, now, even though we have talked about the option on the program menu that allows you to order up a printed version, we've yet to talk about your printer options. So let's do that now. The purpose of your printer is to make a written or hard copy version of the material you've put in your computer. Certain printers are more appropriate for certain jobs. Now, most of you probably bought a printer when you bought your computer, so you should know that there are many kinds of printers, like dot matrix and letter quality. Dot matrix is the most common. The little printing mechanism inside is a series of pins, usually five across and seven down, or nine across and nine down. And that series of pins makes a little matrix of little dots on the paper, hence the name dot matrix printer. When you use the print option of any program and the hard copy or printout begins, here's what happens. The printer takes the characters from the machine and then prints out the little letters on paper in much the same way as lights in a stadium scoreboard show the scores. Now, the more pins you have, the better looking your printout. The speed of most printers is measured by the number of characters, letters, numbers, and symbols it can print in a second. The number of characters per second, or CPS on a good dot matrix printer, can be as many as 400 or as little as 30 CPS. Now that means you could fill a page of copy anywhere from 10 seconds to just over a minute. This makes the dot matrix very handy when you want to get a hard copy or a printout on a program very quickly. Now you can buy a dot matrix printer that will handle average size paper of 8.5 by 11. 
That translates out to about 60 to 132 characters across the page. Of course, that depends on the size of the characters and the kind of program you're running. You can also buy a dot matrix printer with a carriage large enough to handle paper 15 inches wide with 132 characters or more across the page. Maybe you've seen some of those large printouts. Of course, the smaller the printer, the less it costs. And dot matrix printers are considerably less expensive than letter quality or daisy wheel printers. The daisy wheel or letter quality printer doesn't use the dot matrix formation. The characters are taken from this little wheel. It's called a daisy wheel. The printout you get from a daisy wheel printer looks like it was typed on a typewriter, just like any piece of office correspondence. That's where the expression letter quality comes from. However, the letter quality printer takes longer to fill the page. The speeds will vary from 10 to 55 characters per second, and therefore, you may be trading off speed for quality. Now, let's talk about loading paper into your printer. The most common is tractor feed. Uh, that looks like this. You notice the holes on the sides of the paper? Well, that's for the tractor system. Now, you can easily pull these parts away from the page, and you have a standard sheet of paper. This is the system you're most likely to use with your dot matrix printer. Using this printer, I'll give you an idea how the paper is loaded. By moving the paper through the back of the printer, it will catch on to the pins of the tractor feed device. Then you can roll it through with the roller handle for the platen. Now, load your printer. When you load paper into the printer, whether it is continuous run or tractor feed, or single sheet, as in friction feed, you should always make sure that the top of the sheet is at the top of the printer head. This is called top of the form. That will ensure that each sheet of paper that follows will be set to the top. And if you ever get into using some pre-printed forms, it's one of the best ways to keep your place on the form. Another nice thing about using tractor feed paper is that you can buy it in a box with as much as 2,000 sheets. Now, if you need paper with a letterhead, You'll find companies or stationers who will make up this kind of paper with your letterhead on it. And if blank paper will do the job for you, then you'll save money and time. Now let's get ourselves a printout. First, make sure your printer is hooked up and online. Then if your machine isn't already on, boot up with the DOS shell diskette in the drive. Once you get to the main menu by pressing the F1 function key and then the space bar first, you can move the highlighting cursor to the run a program command and press the space bar. Now move the highlighting cursor down the screen to the program labeled print test. Press the space bar to highlight it. Then don't forget to press the F7 function key to activate the command. Your printer will print out a series of numbers letters and symbols that demonstrate what you're able to do with your printer. Some folks like to have both printers. The dot matrix for fast printouts and graphics and charts and the daisy wheel for correspondence and reports. Whichever printer you have or are intending to add to your system, just make sure you get a cable or patch cord that will fit your machine in the locations we showed you on the back of your computer back in segment two. Finally, make sure you read through the owner's manual that came with your printer, and be sure you understand how to set the top of the form. Now that we've covered setting up and booting up your computer, and running the disk operating system, and getting a hard copy printout, we'll tie it all together in the next segment with the important element of software. So you can review this segment right now, or if you like, Steal yourself a little break time before we begin the final segment of Compututor. Okay, what have you got? Again, gin? That's the 34th time that you've... Why do I feel like I should be checking these cards? Hmm. I really think is that these cards are marked. I'm telling you, they're marked. Look at this. Queen of spades, huh? 
ace of diamonds, right? What do we have here? The ace of spades. Welcome back to Compututor and Using Your Machine. Well, once again, I congratulate you. You have really been through the paces of learning just how simple it is to use your hardware and now how to operate the software. Software is what your computer is all about. Just like your video cassette player would be of little value to you without any video cassettes to play, such is the case of your computer. Now, earlier on in segment four, I told you that we would talk at greater length about software and programs. Well, this is that time. It's not necessary to know how to write programs to get value out of your computer. In fact, out of any given group of 100 computer users, that's you, only five people will have any interest in writing programs. More than likely, you'll be using software or programs that have already been written and published to fulfill your needs. And you should know that there are quite a few different kinds of software programs from games to accounts receivable and payable. However, the three most commonly used and in-demand kinds of software are Calc, or the Electronic Spreadsheet, Word Processing, and Database Management. At some time or another, these are the three kinds of software you'll probably be looking to use on your Commodore 128. I'd like to tell you just a bit about them, so let's start with Calc. Calc is short for calculations and is an electronic worksheet. Now, you would use this the same way you might use a sheet of columned paper for working out things like, oh, simple budgets or projected business costs. Maybe you just want to keep a record of your normal home expenses or business costs. If you didn't have a computer, you might go out to a stationery store and buy one of these columned pads. Well, that's what a calc program is, an electronic columned pad. Now, if you filled out one of these pads, and then discovered that some of your figures had to be changed for any reason, you would have to start all over again and fill out a new sheet. With a calc program in your computer, you just change whatever figure you need to change, and the computer will fix up the rest of the pad. Even though you can only see a few columns over and a few rows down the page, you can get lots of columns across and lots of rows down. You just have to imagine you're holding a magnifying glass over a columned page, highlighting the area you're working on. Well, when you look on the CRT, you're focusing on the part of the pad you really want to see. Financial professionals use these worksheets to prepare statements, budgets, compute ratios, and modify projections in seconds rather than hours or days. You can use the same program just as easily to figure out your monthly food budget, list your expenses, or project your earnings and costs on a project. Database management sounds like a pretty impressive term, and when you consider what a simple program it is to use, it's pretty impressive. I'll give you an example of how it works. Think of a filing cabinet that you have at home or in the office. It's filled with drawers that are filled with labeled file folders that are filled with files, and it takes up a lot of space. Now, if you accidentally put the wrong piece of paper in the wrong file folder, and that goes in the wrong drawer, days weeks, months could go by before you find what's missing. And what if you need some information from several different files grouped together in a particular arrangement? More time and more work. What can a database management program do for you? I'll give you an example. Suppose you have a collection of magazines and professional journals. However, your collection is spread out all over the house and all over the office. Suddenly, you're looking for an article on butterfly collecting that you read last summer. Well, with your database manager program, you will have listed all the magazines you've got in that year. You've listed the month you received them, the table of contents, and where you put them all. You simply command the program to scan for the word butterfly, because you're not even sure of the title of the article. The scan might even turn up some other articles on collecting that you'd missed or forgotten. Now, here's another thought. Your Christmas card list, file cards, Virtually anything you want to keep track of fits into a database management program. And it's not that much trouble to keep the information in the computer. You could type it in a little bit at a time or all at once. It doesn't really matter. Because once it's in there, it's in there to stay and you can start using it immediately. Word processing is probably the most popular program for microcomputers because it allows you to turn your computer into an electric typewriter that does a whole lot more than any electric typewriter. You could write anything from a shopping list to the great American novel, fast and cheap. You see, the word processing program uses a process called text editing. Now, that just means you can edit 
delete, change format, move entire blocks of copy, and correct it a dozen times. Search for a specific word or phrase and store it forever on disk. You can reshape it 150 times if you'd like without putting 149 pieces of crumpled up paper in the wastebasket. In fact, waste is a word you will rarely use when you get a word processing program for your microcomputer. And when you do get word processing, typing will never again be the same. Beyond these three programs are many more. In fact, well over a thousand different kinds of computer programs for you to use to make your work go faster and your spare time last longer. To learn more about the kind of software that might fit your needs, just check in with your local computer or software store. Now that we've covered the more popular software programs, you'll find it helpful in understanding all software if you have a hands-on idea of how it is written and how it works. There are many languages that are used for writing software. Now, you've heard us talk about BASIC, Beginner's All-Purpose Symbolic Instruction Code. So we're going to teach you how to write a very simple program in BASIC. Now, don't worry. There are only four lines in this program and very few terms to learn. This little program is designed to convert your age from years to months. Now, here are some of the ground rules about BASIC programs. There are a series of instructions that tell the computer to do things in a certain order. So each line of instruction is numbered. That way the computer will know what instruction is to be taken first, second, and third. Here is what the actual program looks like written in the basic language. Notice how the lines are numbered 10, 20, 30, and 40. Well, very often programmers write programs numbered that way in case they want to add a line in between later for more instructions. The first line is an input statement. That's why it says input right after the number, because you're going to put in some information. In quotation marks is the message that will be put on the screen before you type in your input. The statement asks you to enter your age in years and months. So if you're 25 years old in six months, you would type in the number 25, a comma, and the number six. The semicolon next to the last quotation mark tells the computer there's more information coming. The Y followed by a comma and the M are what are called variables. Now that just means that the values assigned to those letters can vary, just like people's ages can vary. The Y stands for years and the M stands for months. The next line, number 20, looks like an algebraic equation and it is. X, the unknown, will be equal to Y, or the years, multiplied by 12, the number of months in a year, plus M, or the number of months left over. Notice we use an asterisk for the multiplication sign because that's the way the computer likes it. An X is just an X to a computer. However, when writing programs, an asterisk is the multiplication sign. The next line, number 30, is a print statement. That means it will print information on the screen. The first line, the input statement, will also print information on the screen, but it requires you to put in some information. The print statement doesn't require you to add anything. At the end of the print statement, which looks very much like the input statement, is a semicolon telling the machine there's more information to come, and X is that information. Now, don't forget, we've already told the computer that regardless of what numbers are put in for your age in years and months, X will be equal to the number of years multiplied by 12, the number of months in a year, added to the number of leftover months before your next birthday. The last statement, numbered 40, just says end, and that means we're at the end of the program. We'll leave that program up on the screen so you can try it out. Boot up your machine with a formatted data disk get in the drive. Now go ahead and copy that program into your computer, remembering to press the return key after you've typed each line of the instruction or program. Have you finished? If your version doesn't look like what's up here on the screen, just press the return key, type in the word new, press the return key again, and try writing the program again, remembering to press the return key at the end of each line. Now before we run the program, you'll save it using a basic language command called save. Type in the phrase dsave, D-S-A-V-E, then a quotation mark, and a program name, which we'll call age. Now press the return key. To make sure your program made it there, type in the directory, and let's find it. Ah, oh, there it is. 
Now you could type in deload to load the program or deload a quotation mark and the word age and press the return key. That will load the program into the system also. Then you would type the word run, press the return key and the program would run. Or you could simply type run a quotation mark, the word age and press the return key and the program would load and run. When you're ready, type in the word run and see what happens. First, the machine asks you to put in your age in years and leftover months, leaving a comma between the number of years and months. Now press the return key and the machine tells you your age in months. And now, a few final notes on Compututor. No single book or tutorial will ever meet all of your needs. And the best person to teach you about your computer and your software is you. Trial and error is still the best teacher. The intention of CompuTutor is to give you enough information to get your computer online and to get you started. The more you run this program, the more you'll get out of it. I mean, after all, look at what you've accomplished. In a relatively short period of time, you've learned to assemble your equipment, boot up the computer, load and operate the disk operating system, run and save programs, operate your printer, even write a piece of software. And your future is even brighter. Because as you continue to master new programs and new peripherals, you'll discover that your machine is merely a means to an end. It's a device that allows you to do the things you want and the things you do best. Make decisions based on having information readily available. Well, thanks to your Commodore 128, you've done quite well. In many ways, you are well beyond novice. And the next time you see a computer article in a magazine or newspaper, or you hear people talking about their systems, you can participate from the experience of being a user. Not only does CompuTutor congratulate you, we graduate you. What's this? Diplomas? Oh, thanks. That's wonderful. Don't, don't get too excited. There's no prompt. Easy. Easy. It's okay. It's okay.